Art by Pepsi. Pepsi is a proud sponsor of the Surrey Glaciers and Rogers Community 4 television coverage. Have fun, stay young, drink Pepsi. From the people who helped generate this exceptional facility, Alnor Services is a proud sponsor of the Surrey Glaciers baseball team. Alnor has been successfully handling all your heavy equipment needs for 25 years. Specializing in commercial site preparation, excavation, underground services, clearing, demolition, sports fields, and topsoil sales. For more information, call 531-5935 Monday through Friday. And today's television coverage was also sponsored by All Sports Body Quencher. Proud to support the Surrey Glaciers and community television. From the Stetson Bowl in Surrey, B.C., the Surrey Glaciers and Rogers Four Sports present Western Baseball League action. Tonight's game features the Tri-City Posse taking on the Surrey Glaciers. communities of Surrey, Langley, and New Westminster. This is Rogers Community 4. It's a glorious Canada Day evening here at the Stetson Bowl in Surrey, British Columbia, as we get set for this great matchup between the Tri-City Posse and the Surrey Glaciers. Hello everyone, I'm Bill Curry along with Chris Uren and and Chris, the Surrey Glaciers right now in a great position to clinch one of the first ever championships in the Western Baseball League. That's right, Bill. Last night, uh, Surrey picked up a 4-1 victory over the Ben Bandits. That means that Surrey took three of four from the Ben Bandits, and as a result, they've got a healthy three-game lead with only eight games remaining in the first half Western Baseball League schedule. And of course, we'll be here with all the action tonight, but down on the concourse, we've got Steve Erickson. Steve, what do you have in store for us? Thanks, Bill. Tonight, I'm gonna roam around the stands, at least as far as my cable will take me. I'm gonna do lots of different interviews with different people. The biggest thing I noticed, since this is Canada Day, as you alluded to, there are still a lot of people coming in. There is much to do, or there was much to do today, but it's nice to see people that did stay at home decided to come out and take in the Surrey, Surrey Glaciers baseball game. There's an awful lot of fun coming and getting involved now. They feel that this league can grow by leaps and bounds, but the one thing the Glaciers have to do is possibly, from a little bit of perspective, I guess from different people point of view, is go and do a little more selling because I was talking to a gentleman the other day that stayed at the Surrey Inn in Surrey and he said that he walked around Surrey Place Shopping Center and basically never saw any information about the Glaciers baseball team. That's the one thing they have to do. So we want to encourage you to come on down. To I call it Glacier Park down here, but it's actually in Stetson Bowl. This is where they have the rodeo, believe it or not. And come on down, take this event in because it's a good time. It's very, very feasible for the price for a family event. Come on down, Stu Kehoe, Dick Phillips, the rest of the team, they will give you your money's worth and this type of entertainment hey it is just priceless let's go back upstairs to the broadcast booth i couldn't agree with you more there steve it's a wonderful ballpark entertaining baseball and a good quality product as i guess the surrey glaciers tonight are going to give the people of surrey something to look forward to <laughs> well, i think so uh, on the verge of a championship pretty exciting out here at the stetson bowl now the season is split into two halves and uh, the Tri-City Posse on one hand haven't been doing so well on the ball field this season, but they've certainly been a success off the field. 
Well, they've won six of their last four after a horrible, horrible start, but they've got a new stadium down there in the Tri-City area in Pasco, Washington, and they're leading the league in attendance this season. Yep, and also they have one of uh, the more famous major league managers uh, in, this, uh, in this Western League. Tom Treblehorn, former Milwaukee manager, uh, spent five years with the Milwaukee Brewers. Last year was coaching the Chicago Cubs, and this year the, the uh, excuse me, he's, uh, the, he's coaching the Tri-City Posse in the Western Baseball League. And Tom Treblehorn, of course, no stranger to these parts, as he spent some time with uh, the Vancouver Canadians organization when they were involved with Milwaukee. In fact, uh, once he even ended up working for Stu Kehoe, the general manager here in Surrey. Yeah, he's been all around Northwest Baseball. Also coached in Hawaii. I think that would be a pretty good gig, managing a baseball team in Hawaii in the old, uh, the old Hawaii Islanders of the Pacific Coast League. Oh, that would be a wonderful gig. Well, it's almost like a Hawaiian island here at the Stetson Bowl tonight. Gorgeous weather, temperatures into, uh, temperatures into uh, the mid-20s right now. Nice, cool breeze. And we were mentioning Tom Treblehorn earlier on. Uh, Steve Erickson had an opportunity to talk with the former manager of the Cubs and the Brewers. Tom, you've been around, you've been in the major leagues. What did it take to bring you over to a new professional baseball league? Well, I was unemployed, had to have a job, and they wanted to hire me. And uh, I got let go by the Cubs fairly late in the fall, and uh, a lot of the jobs were gone. And I talked to Bruce Engel and Ken Wright, who's the owner of the Tri City Club. And, I said it sounded interesting and here's the things I had to have and they said okay so I kind of decided to have a little fun and, and go back and, and hopefully make some young players better and get them on their road to uh, bigger and better things in their careers and keep my career alive and, and like I said just enjoy myself for a nice season of baseball here in the Northwest. Now with the Tri-City team you're basically, you are hosting the first All-Star game on Monday. Right, uh, July 10th we'll have the All-Star game up there and uh, we're, we're proud to have uh, four of our players and of course uh, three of the, the very, very fine players here from Surrey will be on that club too and I think we'll be an interesting series. It seems like uh, we hit a little bit up here in this division. They got some pitching down in the other division, so it'll be kind of interesting to see how the two All-Star teams match up at our place. And the park's ready. I hope we can get a good crowd. And uh, it's it's exciting to host it. It's kind of a strange thing in that uh, it'll be a little difficult logistically to get players in you know, from Sunday game till to a Monday night game, and and then try to give them a couple days off and be able to get back and start the second half again. But uh, I think it's a, a real honor for the players that are selected, and it's an honor for our city to be hosting it. And, and we, like I said before, looking for, for a nice ball game and a good evening. How are the players adjusting to the new league? Well, it's, uh, I think, well, uh, there's a lot of startup glitches that, that any new league will have, and there's been a couple clubs with some financial difficulty, but I think all the cities we've visited now, this is, this is our final stop. We haven't been to Surrey yet, and so this is the last place we have not been uh, everything seems to be running running pretty well and the, and the people seem to be reasonably excited about what's going on and and I think it's a, a viable alternative for for some cities that don't have teams and organized baseball plus I think it's a, a good place for players to go that don't have a place to play who I think can keep their careers alive and and some of the guys that I've seen I think can step right in and help organizations if they if the organizations have interest and want to sign some guys now with your involvement in the major leagues for the youngsters watching at home right now what type of involvement or, or what type of expertise could you tell them to keep them involved in baseball? Well, they have to play. They have to play uh, uh, baseball as much as uh, they shoot baskets or play soccer or do anything else. And sometimes it's a little difficult to do that because baseball, you kind of have to have a field and somebody to play catch with and do this and that. With. But, you know, you throw a ball against the wall and you hit off a tee and you just like you shoot free throws in basketball and work on your jump shot all by yourself and work on your bank shot or your hook shot or work on some of your soccer skills or go to the weight room for football and, and, and work on the weights. You have to do those individualized things for baseball. I think it's one thing that a lot of baseball players don't do. They, they don't do a lot of the things that you have to do individually to keep keep your skills going even when there's not a game or a practice going on I think uh, people remember back a generation or two when guys would just go to the park and throw the ball around kind of like they go and shoot hoops now and at least in America basketball I think has become the national pastime I don't know about up here uh, but uh, but definitely they have to do a few more things individually on their own to, to, to hone their skills so that they're ready for practice and then ready for games so that they can play well Okay, well, speaking of games and getting them ready for practice and all that, we'll let you go. Thanks very much, Tom, and all the best for the rest of the season. Good Thanks. to be here with you. Thank you. Steve Erickson, along with Tom Treblehorn, the manager of the Tri-City Posse. As you can hear, we're in between anthems here at the Stetson Bowl as uh, a small crowd is out on hand getting ready to... Uh, getting ready to see a show between the Glaciers and the Posse. Let's listen in for a bit. True patriot love in all thy sons command with glowing hearts we see thee rise the true north strong and 
free from far and wide. Oh, Canada, we stand on guard for thee. God, keep our land glorious and free. Finishing up the national anthems here at the Stetson Bowl as we get set for the matchup between the Tri-City Posse and the Surrey Glaciers. Well, with the first half of the season winding down, the Surrey Glaciers have certainly made their mark in this league. Already they're pounding the ball. They've got a comfortable three-game lead in first place in the Northern Division as they get set to wind into the All-Star break. Three members of the Surrey Glaciers on the All-Star team this year. Catcher John Turles, left fielder Jim Murphy, who's had an outstanding first half, and pitcher Joe Strong will also be there in Pasco for the All-Star game. And as you can see on the mound, warming up, right-hander Ricky Rhodes taking his spot on the mound. Rhodes takes a 5-1 and one mark into uh, this first half of the Western Baseball League season as we get set to begin play. Earlier this evening, Steve Erickson had a great opportunity to talk with the manager of the Surrey Glaciers, Dick Phillips, and a little bit about the success they've enjoyed. Dick, the week coming up holds a first place pennant race for you. What do you look for for the week ahead? Well, Steve, uh, we're uh, in command of our own destiny. We've got eight games to go, and we've got a three-game lead over uh, Bend and five games over Tri-Cities. and. All we have to do is keep winning, and we don't have to worry about the rest of them. All-Star game coming up Monday in Tri-Cities, the team you're playing against tonight. Got to be a nice feeling you've got uh, some of the players on the team. We've got three of our players that uh, were elected to the Northern Division uh, All-Star team. Jim Murphy, our left fielder, John Turley, our catcher, and uh, Joe Strong, one of our pitchers. So we're, we're pretty happy about that. Now, going into the All-Star team, are they going to get a chance to practice together during Monday? The, the game is obviously Monday afternoon now. We were told it was the format was changed. Well, it was scheduled for Tuesday afternoon, but because of the Major League All-Star game, uh, they switched it to Monday, so we're just going to show up and maybe have a home run hitting contest and take a little infield and go get them. I guess the biggest question everybody wants to know tonight, you're the, in the first place in the Northern Division. Tri-City is right now in last place. What do you have to do to keep the boys very complacent tonight so they just don't get you know, a little bit too arrogant in the game? Well, whenever you run up against Tom Trevelhorn, you're in for a couple surprises. So we're not, they're only five games behind us. So uh, they still have a good ball club. Okay, Dick, we'll let you go to the dugout right now. Thanks a lot. All right, thanks, Steve. My pleasure. Dick Phillips, the manager of the Surrey Glaciers, talking with Steve Erickson earlier this afternoon. A leadoff hitter, Sean Scott, takes to the box as Ricky Rhodes starts on the mound. We're just about set to begin play here at the Stetson Bowl. Here's the first pitch to Scott. Misses up high for ball one. Scott, another guy who's going to get a chance to play in that All-Star game in Pasco. Hitting 266 this season. Leads the league in stolen bases, though, with 19. Going to be an interesting speed battle on the base path as Rhodes comes across with his first strike of the ball game. Another guy chasing Scott in the lead for stolen bases, uh, Richard Ernst over in the Glaciers. Sticking very close as Rhodes delivers. There's a chopper to Lewis at short. Handles it easily, and there's one gone. Well, Joe Lewis, a slick fielding shortstop for the Surrey Glaciers, had no trouble at all retiring the leadoff batter, Sean Scott. That'll bring Ed Generelli to the plate, batting second. Here you see it on the replay. Just a little chopper. Lewis charging, takes it on the short hop, and flips the first for the out. That'll bring things to uh, Ed Generelli, the second baseman, as Rhodes delivers. <laughs> Little breaking ball that just misses on the outside part of the plate, and it's 1-0. and We've seen Rhodes pitch earlier in the year, in fact, on our last Rogers broadcast. 
It comes across again, misses low this time. Big fella at six foot five, comes in with an impressive five and one record, but his ERA at 6.38 shows that he's been getting a lot of run support from his Surrey teammates. Rhodes just misses at the knees there, and he's behind the count 3-0. and Ed Generelli hitting 268 on the season. No home runs, eight RBIs, but eight stolen bases, so this posse team can really run in the top half of the order. And it looks like Generelli's going to get a chance to run as Rhodes walks him on four consecutive pitches. Well, Rhodes has given up a lot of walks this season, 33 of them. In fact, leads the league in walks given up. Strikes out a lot of batters, too, 23 strikeouts. But uh, overpowering stuff gets a little wild sometimes. And there he walked the second hitter of the inning at Generelli. Generelli's been caught stealing three times. But here's Greg Mussarino, the designated hitter. As he pops one up high into short left, Lewis is under it, just on the edge of the infield grass, and there's two gone. So Musarino's retired as Ricky Rhodes steps on the rubber once more. Rhodes has a famous brother by the name of Arthur Rhodes who pitches in the Baltimore chain, actually is with the Orioles. Pitched last night, in fact, with uh, against the Toronto Blue Jays. Uh, here's Alan Thompson at the plate. Takes a big cut there. Thompson hitting 278 on the season. Has managed four home runs, 19 RBIs. As you see the lead, that Generelli is taking over at first, and Rhodes showing the proper concern. So you mentioned earlier, Chris, that uh, Rhodes has a tendency to walk some hitters, but uh, he also has a tendency to strike out as many as he walks. As the runner goes on the pitch, it's fouled hard down the first base grandstand. But Generelli had a hell of a jump there. Yeah, it looks like Generelli would have had the base stolen if it wasn't fouled off by Alan Thompson. Talking about Rhodes, you mentioned earlier, Bill, that uh, a typical Rhodes outing, his last time out, where he walked eight and struck out eight over, what, seven innings, I believe. Yeah, six and one-thirds, his last performance, which was Tuesday night against the what was then the first place Ben Bandits. Here's the 0-2 pitch, just misses. And that'll bring the count to one and two. As Alan Thompson is still up to, at the plate behind the count. Over to first, and they've got Generelli hung. Get to him. Over to, over to second base as Joe Lewis applies the tag. And Ed Generelli is caught on the pickoff play. So nothing across for the Tri-City Posse in the top half of the first inning. Surrey Glaciers coming to bat. Taking a look at this Surrey Glaciers lineup coming into this ball game, Richard Ernst will be leading things off playing center field. Fidel Banuelos batting second out in right field. Corey Parker will bat third, he's the first baseman. Jim Murphy in the cleanup spot, batting fourth. He's in left field. He'll be followed up by Ricky Scruggs in the number five slot as the designated hitter. The catcher, John Turles, bats sixth. Nestor Serrano, the third baseman, bats seventh. Greg Bergeron at second is in the number eight slot. And Joe Lewis will finish things off at the number ninth slot at short. And taking a look at the standings, you see Tri-City in third place in the Northern Division. Started off the season playing about 300 ball, but uh, they've taken six of their last 10. So they're on a bit of a tear by their standards, and uh, they've moved out of the basement with their win last night. Grays Harbor now residing in the basement of the Northern Division standings. Looking at the defense for the Tri-City posse, it's Booker, Scott, and DeFabio from left to right in the outfield. Thompson, Wallace, Pizzoni, and Babbitt across the infield and the battery is made up of Bobby Moore and Mike Hubel 
Bobby Moore, a 37-year-old who's had just one start here in the Western Baseball League, apparently uh, lives in the Tri-City area, 37 years old, had retired from baseball after trying to become a replacement player and was all over Tom Treblehorn's case to put him on the roster. Treblehorn finally did it. Last week, Moore got his first start, and now he's getting his second start against Surrey. So he's earned himself a job here as he serves one up to Richard Ernst, and he delivers for strike one. Bobby Moore pitched in uh, the Northern League last season, I believe, one of uh, one of the other big independent leagues. Ernst shows bunt there for a second, pulls it back, and he's in the hole. Richard Ernst batting 227 on the year, but the real story about Ernst is his speed. Among the top stolen basemen in the Western Baseball League, he has 15 on the year, but He's called on strikes, three consecutive pitches. Bobby Moore has his first strikeout of the game. Moore not even throwing hard. He got him with a big bender on that pitch. Take a look at it. There's the pitch just broke down and across the plate. Ernst looking and he's going to take a seat in the dugout. Even from that angle, you could see that uh, there was no doubt about that one. So Bobby Moore showing the big slow hook on Richard Ernst, and now he has Fidel Banuelos to contend with. Banuelos hitting 275 on the air as Moore delivers. Well, at 37 years old, I expect Moore is going to need to rely on his breaking stuff. He did make it to the majors with the San Francisco Giants. Yeah, that's no small feat on its own. But he misses inside again, and he's behind the count 2-0. and So I guess more with all that, uh, with a little bit of Major League experience as he comes across for strike, has, uh, has a little bit of pull with guys like Tom Treblehorn when uh, looking for work after their Major League careers are over. Popped up down the third base side. It's in foul territory. Third baseman Troy Babbitt has a line on it. Gathers it in, and there's two gone. Now Corey Parker's going to step into the box. A two-run home run last night, his seventh of the season. That ties him for the team lead as we take a look at the flyout by Banuelos. Take a look at the pitch he hit. Looked almost like a fastball. Probably was. You can't tell that well in slow motion. Fastball with excellent location just on the outside corner to Banuelos. Popped harmlessly up into foul territory. But Moore delivers to Parker. Misses inside for ball one. Parker has some of the power on the Surrey lineup as Moore delivers again. This one sharply fouled behind the third base grandstand. And as a bunch of kids go running after it on the dirt behind the grandstand. Still no netting here at the Stetson Bowl, so there's lots of souvenirs available if you show up in the stands. As the foul balls a plenty come your way. Think Parker broke the bat on that one as it goes drifts foul down the left field line. Certainly sounded like that. And despite a lack of velocity, no one is getting around on Moore. All those foul balls are going to the opposite field. Parker having trouble with Moore at this point. So it'll be interesting to see how these hitters adjust. There's another slow bender. This time it misses low. And the count's even at two. Now Corey Parker, who can provide some of the punch in this Surrey Glaciers lineup swings through a big pitch, and that'll retire the side. A pair of strikeouts for Bobby Moore here in the bottom half of the first. Nothing across for either team. There's no score after one complete. So we see the panoramic view of the Stetson Bowl. Beautiful ballpark with the Cloverdale Raceway off to center field. It's 3.30 down the lines, 400 straightaway center. You've got the stables for the Cloverdale Rodeo off to right, so quite a pretty picture if you head on out. So after one complete, we're going to take a break. This is Western League Baseball.
So you've heard about the new Western Baseball League and the only Canadian city in the league is Surrey and our team is called the Surrey Glaciers. But if you want to see televised coverage of one of their games, then there's only one place to catch the action. And that's right here on Rogers Community 4. Our next game will be Saturday, July the 8th, when the Glaciers host the Grey Harbor Gulls. There will be a two-hour tape delay and can be seen at 9 p.m. So catch all the action right here on Rogers Community 4. Looking, be looking forward to that one next Saturday night, July the 8th, as the Glaciers take on the Grey's Harbor Gulls. There's the pitch to Alan Thompson. It's the count's even at one. Thompson, of course, leading off the inning after the pickoff play by Generelli. Generelli, of course, picked off to finish off the first half of the top of the top half of the first, I should say. But Thompson finds himself in the hole one and two on the power of Ricky Rhodes. Thompson hitting 278 on the year. Holds back on the breaking ball by Rhodes. Mention the four home runs and 19 RBIs. Thompson's been able to produce for the posse. Bit of power behind uh, what's been a disappointing first half for the folks from Tri-Cities. Last year, Alan Thompson was the NAIA Player of the Year in the United States. NAIA, of course, the uh, division Simon Fraser University plays in, an alternative to the NCAA. Now, if they only had baseball on that program. Holds off the high fastball, or did he? They appeal down to first. Field umpire says, no way, and Thompson's aboard with a leadoff walk. This is dead dead. So as you can see, Ricky Rhodes missing high and outside with the fastball, or inside, I should say. Little tough for those power hitters to lay off those when they see it up by the letters. But here's Kevin Booker hitting 267 on the year. Four home runs, 23 RBIs. He takes the first pitch for strike. Kevin Booker out of the University of Central Arkansas and drafted by the Chicago Cubs. We all know a uh, famous Chicagoan who, is, who played at uh, Central Arkansas, Scotty Pippen, yeah. now with the Bulls. Managed to stay in Chicago for now. Hit high and foul behind the first base grandstand. I don't know if you can hear it, but you gotta love that big red bang that the ball makes when it rattles off the roof here. It's a bit like playing in a barn. Yeah, corrugated tin roof painted red, and it makes a lot of noise when that ball hits it. There's the lead by Thompson down at first. And here's the 0-2. Fouled back once again, this time underneath the grandstand as it rattles around. Lucky Fan gets a souvenir on that one. You're wondering about, there you see him. It's about to say, if you're wondering about Thompson's speed down at first, he does have five stolen bases, but here's one chopped up the middle. Nice dive by the second baseman, Greg Bergeron, but he can't get a hold of it. And the posse of men at first and second with no one out. Well, the first hit of the ball game for either team. Here we see it uh, fighting off the breaking ball from Rhodes, just chopping it up the middle. Bergeron couldn't quite get to it. Looked like he was playing Booker to hit the ball the other way, given Rhodes' speed. And as a result, what could have been a tailor-made double play slipped into center field for a single. So Rhodes finds himself in a bit of a situation as Troy Babbitt shows bunt down the third baseline. But it's easily foul, and he's behind 0-1. One, oh one. Babbitt, the third baseman for Tri-City, hitting 286 this season, 11 RBIs, no home runs. And with 
a chance to improve on that RBI total as Ricky Rhodes tries to figure out a way out of this one. Rhodes has faced uh, some serious situations, especially in that bend game this past Tuesday. As he misses up and outside to even up the count at one. Rhodes, Rhodes went six and one thirds innings in and left behind what seemed to be a very comfortable seven to one lead for the Surrey Glaciers, but left some runners on base. They came around to score and at one point the Glaciers were only looking at a slender one run lead against uh, one of the contending teams in the Northern Division. They managed to pull that one out with a 9-6 win as Charles has to scoop that one out of the dirt. Count goes to one and two. Well, you just need to look at the walk totals and uh, realize that Rhodes is gonna get himself into some situations. He lets a lot of runners on base, but still five and one record, so he's gotta be happy about that. Yeah, he can win ball games for you. The one, two. Driven hard into right field. Not a problem for Fidel Banuelos. Runners tag, but just jump off enough to draw a throw. And a nice play by Banuelos getting that ball in quickly. Thompson not willing to test the arm of Banuelos. There we see the pitch and the ball driven hard into right field. Banuelos positioned perfectly to make the catch, however. And then he, throw, he shows that strong arm getting to second. Here's Ron Pizzoni hitting 229. A shortstop. Rhodes delivers. That one's driven hard down the left field line. It's fair. It'll go all the way to the corner. Thompson comes around to score. Booker will hold at third. On the first pitch, Pizzoni drives it to left field for a stand-up double. Pizzoni really getting around on that pitch. Murphy doing a good job playing the ball in the corner. We'll see it on the replay here. Pizzoni looking fastball all the way and he gets it. Just turns on the high inside fastball, drives it down the line. In fact, you saw the dust created by the foul line on that one. So Rhodes now with runners at second and third with only one out for Mike Hubel. Hubel the catcher hitting 284 on the year. One home run, seven RBIs. But he struck out 26 times this season. Posse up, one nothing here in the top half of the second as Rhodes misses high this time. Well, Mike Hubel was once in the Toronto organization, got up to AAA Syracuse, and is billed as having the strongest throwing arm in the Western Baseball League. We'll see if that's the case when uh, Surrey gets some base runners as this game goes along. But he pops this one up into the infield. Corey Parker, the first baseman, waves for it. And there's two gone. So the posse, with runners in scoring position here, continue to threaten. Uh, you'll see Ricky Rhodes putting it right on the end of the bat. Not a lot you could do with it there. No problems for Corey Parker whatsoever. Jerry DeFabia blasts the first pitch foul. And the count's 0-1. DeFabia hitting 323 over 35 games. So he has one home run, 17 RBIs, but they've moved him to add a, all the way down to add a little bit of punch into the number nine slot. Sometimes see major league managers doing that. The 0-1. Misses. Ricky Rhodes, the six foot plus right hander, coming to the belt. Delivers a breaking ball, comebacker. 
I wonder if Rhodes wanted to handle that one all by himself, but he tosses over to Parker at first. And the Glaciers get out of this, only giving up a run. A posse deliver, but can only score one here in the top half of the second. And they lead the Glaciers by a score of one to nothing. Let's see what Steve Erickson's up to. Steve? Thanks, Bill. Right now, I'm just relaxing. Gentleman sitting just to my immediate right, Randy's the gentleman that sells all the souvenirs here for the glaciers down just in this wide area. Randy, how are the souvenir sales going? Well, they're not too bad. Uh, you know, some nights better than others, but on average, you know, uh, it's doing pretty good, fairly respectable, especially for a first year organization that's, you know, a brand new league, brand new team, brand new location, and uh, people are starting to get wise to the idea that there's good baseball going on here, and they're coming out to see it. And when they do, <laughs> they see this fine merchandise and can't help but buy some. So. Which is your better seller? Uh, I think right now the pennants. Just price-wise? Just price-wise. Everybody can afford them. Uh, there's a lot of kids that come down to the game, so, you know, Dad doesn't mind doling out three bucks for a pennant. It's, uh, either that or ten bucks for a hat. It gets you find, a little more pricey. Do you find this is more for the families? Absolutely. It's completely a family atmosphere. And, uh, you know, you see lots of moms and their kids and uh, lots of whole families. And uh, kids are running around. They have a thing that they do. It's called... Uh, uh, baseball buddies, I believe, where they bring yeah, the kids out for the minor league, uh, little league teams around here, and uh, those kids get a real big kick out of being out in the field and getting introduced over the loudspeaker and everything like that. So, yeah, uh, they sure do. Yeah, well, you, you know, they bring their enthusiasm with them and take a souvenir. Well, we need it. That's what we need. That's Absolutely. What we need. Thanks, Thanks very much. For the park. Thanks, Randy. Good talking to you. Okay, let's go back up to Bill. Thanks, Steve. So he figured merchandise is going well with the Glaciers with one of the cooler logos. But here's Jim Murphy driving it deep into left field. Foul. Guess we should mention Jim Murphy possesses an awful lot of power on this Surrey team. Seven home runs for the season, 36 RBIs among the league leaders in both those categories, and a sterling 354 batting average this year. There it goes into left field. Devin Booker had to fight it for a moment, but makes the backhanded grab. And Murphy is gone. Well, he certainly hit the ball hard. Unfortunately, right to Kevin Booker. As you take a look here on the play, Murphy's in a bit of a home run slump. He hasn't hit a home run in almost two and a half weeks. And at one point, he was in the, he was in the home run race of the Western Baseball League in the early part of the season. But he's gone. Here's Ricky Scruggs, the hitter. Still Murphy with his seven home runs, only two behind Jim Coher of Bend, so. Yeah. Still has a chance to take that first half home run title. If they keep that stat. We should mention, of course, that like most minor leagues, the Western Baseball League season is, is split into half seasons. So if the Surrey Glaciers can retain their first place lead until the 9th of July, they'll be in the postseason uh, playing the second half champion in the Northern Division. Scruggs is ahead of the count 2-0 here. As Moore delivers, fastball across the heart line. Ruggs with an impressive 319 average of the on the year. Of course, he was the hero in our last broadcast game against the Sonoma County Crushers. He had the monstrous grand slam home run to, to right field to lead the Glaciers to an 8-4 victory. Here he's managed to work the count to three and one. That's the deepest that a count has gone with Moore on the mound. Moore with excellent control this evening so far. Chopped down to first. Thompson will take care of it himself, and there's two away. But again, the ball hit hard. We're starting to see Surrey players catching on to Moore. There you see it. That's a nice pitch by Moore as he kept the ball down. A little bit of movement, but fielded well and cleanly by Alan Thompson, who just trots over to first for the out. And those ground ball pitchers are worth a fortune to your team. But Terlace doesn't hit a ground ball, but pops up the first pitch to shallow left field. The shortstop 
Pizzoni drifts back and retires the side. Glaciers go down in order once again, and after two complete, Posse lead it by a score of one to nothing. As you can see the scene here at the Stetson Bowl, old stadium but brand new ballpark for the city of Surrey, British Columbia. Built originally for Expo in 1986, the home of the Cloverdale Rodeo, still the home of the Cloverdale Rodeo, but now the home for Surrey's first professional baseball team. As you can see, the Glaciers will continue their homestand this week. Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday, they'll be at home to the Tri-City Posse. And on Thursday, July the 6th, they'll be at home to the Grays Harbor Gulls. So a couple of Washington matchups coming our way down to the Stetson Bowl. Lots of great weather here as well. And they'll finish off the first half of the season against Grays Harbor next weekend. So if you head out to the Stetson Bowl sometime this week, chances are you'll be able to see the, the Glaciers clinch the first pennant ever in Western Baseball League history. Lots of tickets available. You can get them through Ticketmaster or at the box office two hours before game time. Now we mentioned the three-game lead for the Surrey Glaciers. Only eight games remaining so far in the season. Yeah. Getting down to the time where you could work out a magic number for them. Magic number of five. Wow, you're, you're pretty quick <laughs> in your math there, Chris. <laughs> Ricky Rhodes doesn't need to do a lot of math right now. He has allowed three base runners last inning. One's come across, but he's managed to just keep one runner from crossing the plate, I should say. As you can see, that Saturday night game against Grays Harbor can be seen on Rogers Community 4. And we'll have a couple of more games coming your way. Sunday, July 23rd, we've got some second half action when the Long Beach Barracuda come to town. And later in August, the 19th, I believe, you'll get your second chance to see the Tri-City Posse. A team that's hoping to take some momentum into the second half of the season. There's a bunt laid down by Sean Scott. Just foul down the first base side. Scott grounded to short his first time up, back in the first inning. Trying to take advantage of a little bit of that speed. Not a bad idea at all. We mentioned he's the league leader in stolen bases, obviously pre possesses a great set of wheels. But behind the count, 0-1. There you see your score as Rhodes delivers. Down low in the dirt, the count's even. One of the things we haven't seen a lot from Ricky this evening is his velocity. He can pump that ball up into the 80s as he grounds over to first. Parker will throw over to Rhodes, who's quick to cover, and there's two gone, or one gone. Taking a look at the replay. Good pitch, kept low by Rhodes. Ball just chopped towards the hole between first and second, but getting over there is Parker, who's fairly mobile at first base, and he flips to Rhodes. Good execution. One away. Yeah, Rhodes can hustle over there for the big man. He used to play basketball, in fact. There's Ed Generelli, who's playing hard tonight down at second as he takes the first pitch for strike. Generelli wasn't on our original Tri-City lineup. We would, if, uh, if, Tom Treblehorn decided to go with his original order. We would have seen another ex-major leaguer as he swings through the breaking ball. In Tim Wallace. Not to be confused with Tim Wallach, although Wallace did play in the Expos organization. And has actually earned himself a spot on the All-Star team here in the Western Baseball League. The 0-2 pitch misses outside. Generelli, as you saw on the graphic, was hitting 268 coming into this game. Wallace, however, hitting uh, considerably lower 220. As that pitch got away from Rhodes down in the dirt. John Terlace, the catcher behind the plate, has been taking a beating over the last week or so. In fact, uh, 
the Tuesday night game against Bend, he took a foul, he took a ball in the dirt that caught him underneath the throat protector, got nailed in the shoulder twice, and as a result, they went with Corey Reeder on Wednesday night behind the plate to give Terlace a little bit of a break back there. Rhodes has driven the count full. There's a reason they call that catcher's gear tools of ignorance, Bill. <laughs> I've known a lot of that in my time. It's hit deep to right field, well foul as it goes down by the Glacier's offices. Bunch of kids scattering for it. Ah, but it goes into that player's area. Come on, let the kids in. Rhodes has actually driven the count full to Ed Generelli. It's a 3-2 count as he delivers the payoff once more. This time he misses high, and he's walked his third batter of the game. Well, three innings and three walks. In the last inning, he walked Alan Thompson to lead off the inning. Thompson came around to score. Here we'll take a look at the pitch from Rhodes. It's the fastball up high. Really seems to be the problem for, for Rhodes. When he misses, he seems to miss high an awful lot. Mm. Entered this game with 33 walks, 23 strikeouts. Generelli goes on the, on the pitch. Lewis was breaking towards second base, and it goes through the hole. And Generelli will scamper all the way down to third on the single by Musarino. Textbook lesson on the hit and run. This is the way you do it. You get your runner going from first. That means the shortstop have to come, has to come over to second, creating a big hole between second and third. And that's where Musarino put the baseball. Perfect execution. And no chance for Joe Lewis, who had to pick between the lesser of two evils. So Alan Thompson comes up with runners at the corners and one out. He walked and scored last inning as he takes the first pitch for ball. It's interesting, Thompson has actually been up to bat three times in this game so far. He worked deep into account with Rhodes back in the first before Ed Generelli was picked off first to end the inning, but he hits it deep to center field. Ernst has to go way back. Generelli will have no problem scoring on the tag. Posse are up now two to nothing. So despite, despite stepping up to the plate three times in this contest, Thompson has yet to record official of an official at bat. He's walked once, and here he hits a towering fly ball, getting the job done. There you see the big swing from Thompson, drives it deep into center field. Ernst gets back there to make the catch, but no chance at all to throw out Generelli, who was on third base at the time. For someone who's never officially been at bat, he certainly, uh, certainly has produced. Scoring once and now driving in another run. As Kevin Booker fouls the first pitch back close to our broadcast location. Got to keep an eye out for those. You can see the effect the wildness has had on Ricky Rhodes' ERA as he's walked two batters that have come around to score already in this game and we're only in the third inning. Booker got on base last inning. As he pops up foul down the first base side. Booker finds himself in the hole 0 and 2 with two gone. Here in the top half of the third inning. As Ricky Rhodes has to deal with a 2 nothing Tri-City Posse lead. Game of note that the Glaciers are closely watching. They recently took three out of four off the Bend Bandits. Well, the Bandits, who are now in a position to chase the Glaciers for first place, are in Grays Harbor tonight. <laughs> Takes the pitch in there for called strike three. And Kevin Booker doesn't like it too much, but Ricky Rhodes records his first strikeout of the game. And a pretty critical one in this situation. So the posse come across with one more run. Here in the top half of the third, they lead it two nothing over the Surrey Glaciers. Due up for, due up for the Glaciers, 
this inning, Nestor Serrano, Greg Bergeron, and Joe Lewis, the seven, eight, and nine hitters. Steve Erickson, what's happening? Thanks, Bill. I'm downstairs here. We covered the Canada Cup, as you're well aware of, about a week ago. The gentleman joining me to my left, Craig McLaren, he helped me out in the broadcast. Craig, you've been out here a couple times taking the Glacier Games. You must be enjoying it. It's really great. I really think it's good. They should promote it a little more, uh, maybe more a few television ads or something and more on the radio and get more crowds. The crowds are fairly good, but it would be nice to see the stands filled up. Well, it sure would be. Now, you've been out here a couple times. A little bit of a difference in uh, venue change-wise, considering this is where the Cloverdale Rodeo takes place. Really great change. I didn't recognize the facility when I first came out a few weeks, and uh, it's a really good improvement. I think it looks really great. The facility must be nice for the ball players too. Hopefully, they'll enjoy this, and the fans will enjoy it. If they come out and see it, they really would come back. I'm sure. Okay. Before I let you go and sit down and enjoy the rest of the game, thoughts on the Canada Cup for next year? Canada Cup was great this year, and next year, if they have the same teams or um, better caliber teams, it'll be a super venue. Okay, good. Greg, we'll let you go sit down. Thanks okay. very much. And uh, just before I go back upstairs, I'm going to let you know, a lot of people ask me about this widened portion down here below it, or right between us here. My, my theory was I said it was for emergency vehicles, but I was out to lunch. Stu Kehoe told me this area back here is going to be for future considerations for box seating. And Bill gets first seat. Bill? We always get first seat, but I'm going to save the, next, the, the one next to me for Steve, I think. Yeah. Fidel Banuelos works the count to 0-1 to lead things off in the bottom half of the third. Or I should say Nestor Serrano. That's Serrano's first plate appearance as the Glaciers have yet to get a base hit in this game or even a base runner. He fouls Bobby Moore's next offering. Foul down the left field side. Last inning we saw the Glaciers hit some balls very, very hard and there Serrano really got around on a pitch from Moore. But he chops this one foul towards the Glacier dugout. Or it should say Tom Treblehorn's dugout. Here's the one two. Misses outside. Serrano, a product of the Mariners organization. Spent last season with Bellingham. Fouls the next offering. And the count remains at two and two. Serrano has moved his average up to 318. He's improved his hitting steadily as he's gone along this season. One home run, 15 RBIs on the year. He's hit some hard balls this week. As he hits this one towards the hole, here comes a sharp play, and he won't have a chance at Serrano. But nice effort by the shortstop, Ron Pizzoni, to get a hold of that ball and hustle off a throw down to first. Serrano has the Glacier's first hit of the game. Well, you knew the way the Glaciers were starting to hit more hard that there was going to be a base hit sooner or later. Now, this ball wasn't hit terribly hard, but it just found the spot. Pizzoni trying for the flying throw as he backhanded that one, but just not enough on it as Serrano was down there with no trouble at all. Serrano does have reasonably good speed, although he hasn't had a stolen base on the year yet. Trying to start a, a, a tradition of small, speedy third baseman. The great Bergeron took the first pitch for strike one. Bergeron has started every game at second base for the Glaciers this season. Proving to be a workhorse, even though he's hitting uh, a modest 215 on the year. Yeah, he throws the leather around with authority out there at second. Though. Sure good does. Fielder. Good fielder. Almost made a nice diving grab back in the second. But he's behind the eight ball here, 0-2. With Serrano down at first. Bergeron is one of those former Lethbridge Mounties playing on this Glacier Club. Coming out of the Pioneer League. That's a team with no major league affiliation, although it is playing in, I guess, what they call organized baseball. I hate that term. <laughs> organized baseball? Here's the one, two. This is down low in the dirt. Well, sure, why should 
The National Association, which represents all of the affiliated teams, dictate that they're to be called organized baseball. Well, they call something like this unorganized baseball. It's a philosophy question. The 2-2, oh, it hit Bergeron hard. Jeez, oh my goodness. You can see he's in a great deal of pain down there. This could turn into a serious situation for the Glaciers. They are not notoriously deep in the infield. I don't know how that uh, audio came through on television sets, but it sounded like a gunshot up here. He took that one right off the ankle bone, it looked like. Let's take a look. There it is, a fastball oh, low. Oh boy, did right that one hurt. Right off the kneecap. Yeah, right off the kneecap. And I think we're going to have to have a replacement for Bergeron. I'm impressed he's just getting up, let alone going out to first base there. I can't see Bergeron staying in this ball game, although, quite honestly, uh, the Surrey Glaciers don't have a lot of choices of who they can put down at second. And Garrett Quintance is a third baseman by nature. Maybe they could switch him over to second base or maybe move Serrano over and put Quintance at third. But either way, I don't think there are options that Dick Phillips would be too fond of. Well, Bergeron's gonna stay out there. That's a tough customer. He's a gonna earn his $1,000 this month. Now Bergeron's hit by the pitch as Bobby Moore will take a few warm-up pitches to stay loose out there. Bergeron, I suppose, lucky that Moore's not a real fireballer at this stage in his career. Yeah, yeah, I could imagine what damage that would have done. Although that one hit Bergeron pretty hard. Now here's Joe Lewis with runners at first and second, no one out. This man has been hitting the ball pretty well this week as he swings hard through the first pitch for strike one. He's, he's still hitting below the Mendoza line, hitting 194. Ah, but to add some spice to this at bat, if he gets a hit here, he's up to the 200 mark. But he shows bunt all the way. This one's going to drift foul down the third baseline. That's something we've seen a lot of from Joe Lewis with runners on base. But he did manage to go four for four in a game against Bend on Wednesday. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Joe Lewis has worked the count to 0-2 here in the bottom half of the third inning. He grounds the ball down to third. Babbitt will step on it over to first for a 5-3 double play. Well, nicely played by Babbitt, but uh, perfect tailor-made double play ball as well. We mentioned Lewis having some troubles at the plate this season. There he turns on a pitch, hits it sharply, but right to Babbitt at third. Babbitt steps on his bag, goes to first, and had Lewis by more than a step. So Bergeron down at second with two gone here in the bottom half of the third will leave things in the hands of Richard Ernst. Ernst struck out looking his first time up. That led things off for the Glaciers. As he chops this one into shallow left field, that'll drop. Bergeron takes a big turn around third base. The throw gets past him. Bergeron will scamper home and score. And the Icemen are on the board. Heads up play by Bergeron, who came down from third base, even though he was in apparent pain running all the way. Managing to score on the wild throw towards home. Didn't look like the throw was really that far off line. I thought Hubel should have come up with this one. There we see the throw from Booker. Yeah, that's not that hard a throw. I mean, it came up on the catcher Hubel. 
And Moore just had trouble getting to it as it took a funny bounce off the backstop. And there's a base hit by Fidel Banuelos, and they'll try and score. Ernst all the way up in second. A Cuba drops the ball at the plate. Ernst is safe. The ball game's tied. Cubo had Ernst dead at home, but couldn't hang on to the baseball. And once he fumbled that one, with Ernst sliding in, there wasn't a hope in Hades he'd be able to hang on to it. Well, a tough couple of plays for the catcher, Mike Hubel, as he bobbles the throw from center fielder Sean Scott. A good throw from Scott. The ball was there in time. Hubel did a good job blocking the plate, but he had to catch the ball first, and he didn't do that. So the Glaciers have pushed two runs across here in the third inning as Corey Parker steps up to the plate. Parker was more second strikeout of the game as we see the replay of the last play. Banuelos chopping it to center. But what was great was Ernst came all the way around from second to score on that play. A gutsy running decision by Dick Phillips. They had him at the plate. Had Hubel been able to hang on to the ball. Parker's ahead in the count, 2-0. and oh. And Moore falls behind once again. So it looked like that the Glaciers were going to go down harmlessly after Lewis hit into the 5-3 double play. I guess the count is 3-0 and now, I should say. Four hits wrapped out by the Surrey Glaciers. Of the five batters that have come to the plate, only Joe Lewis has failed to pick up a single in this inning. 3-1 is swung on. You could just see Surrey in the last inning, in the second inning, chomping at the bit to get up there and hit against Moore again. They've taken advantage here in the third. I guess it gets more serious now that he's gone through the batting order once and everyone's looked at him. The ball gets away from Hubel. As Parker walks down to first, Fidel Banuelos will easily wander down to third base. Let's see that pitch by Moore. That's a tough play for Hubel there. Yeah, got to rule that a wild pitch. That one was in the dirt. And it didn't come up the way it uh, was expected to by Hubel. So runners on the corners here in the third inning. And not a man you like to see up at the plate if you're Bobby Moore in Jim Murphy. Murphy really hit the ball hard his last time up as he lined the ball into deep left field, just put it on a rope, unfortunately, right towards Kevin Booker. Yeah. As Moore looks Corey Parker back at first base. One of the league leaders in RBIs with 36 up there, too. Yeah. Moore showing an unusual interest in Corey Parker down at first. Parker does not have a stolen base yet on the year, as you see Jim Murphy's impressive statistic. And the count's even at one and one. You gotta think if you're Moore, you don't wanna give Murphy too much to hit. He's got an open base at first base right now. Murphy hasn't been getting a lot of good pitches to hit lately as he's in a bit of a mini slump, dropping his average from 368 entering the week down to 354. He entered the week leading the Western League in hitting, but now he's dropped to what I believe is uh, fourth place in the league. The one, two to Murphy, fouled back. As Murphy sneers back at Moore. You know, Murphy is a bit frustrated. He hasn't been getting a lot of fastballs. As I guess every pitcher in the league now has a good book on him. Run, run. 
One, two, down in the dirt once more, but Parker will stay down at first as Hubel did a good job to get in front of that. Certainly did. Keeping Parker at first base and out of scoring position. Murphy, a fantastic athlete, we had mentioned before, a former safety for the UBC football team. Power and speed to boot. Another one gets away from Moore. I mean, you want to pitch around Murphy in this situation because it's, I can't say it's pretty harmless if you put him on because you follow him up with another power hitter like Ricky Scruggs. But at the same time, you don't want to be getting the ball past your catcher. Well, Hubel's getting a real workout this inning, no question about that. A payoff pitch, swung on and missed, and Murphy goes down on strikes. But the Surrey Glaciers, even though they strand a pair of runners, managed to push two runs across here in the bottom half of the third inning. The score is tied at two apiece. We'll be back right after this message. Today's game is brought to you in part by Pepsi. Pepsi's a proud sponsor of the Surrey Glaciers and Rogers Community 4 television coverage. Have fun, stay young, drink Pepsi. From the people who helped generate this exceptional facility, Alnor Services is a proud sponsor of the Surrey Glaciers baseball team. Alnor has been successfully handling all your heavy equipment needs for 25 years specializing in commercial site preparation, excavation, underground services, clearing, demolition, sports fields, and topsoil sales. For more information, call 531-5935, Monday through Friday. And today's television coverage was also sponsored by All Sports Body Quencher proud to support the Surrey Glaciers and community television. We're back for the top half of the fourth inning. And here to bring you all the action, here's Chris Uren. Score is tied at two here in the top of the fourth. It'll be Troy Babbitt, the third baseman, leading things off for the Tri-City Posse. He'll be followed by Ron Pezzoni and Mike Hubel. Hubel, who had a bad inning behind the plate, his last inning, and swinging on the first pitch is the third baseman, Babbitt, chopping it foul. Rhodes still in the game. Ricky Rhodes on the mound for the Surrey Glaciers. Score tied at two. Count is at 0-1. Babbitt coming into this contest, hitting 286. He flied out to right field in his first at bat. Harry lost another fly ball. That one towards left, but it gets out of the ballpark in a hurry. And the count moves to 0 and 2. Troy Babbitt uh, played a while in the Kansas City Royals organization. 0-2 pitch from Rhodes. Swung on and missed. Babbitt sits down. That was a big breaking ball across for a strike. Babbitt. Couldn't get a hold of it, and there's one out here in the fourth, just the second strikeout for Ricky Rhodes so far in this contest. Should mention his second consecutive strikeout. As you see, uh, maybe Rhodes starting to find a bit of that form. You see the bottom just dropped out of that breaking ball. Completely That's fooled. So Ron Pizzoni at the plate now, batting from the, le from the right side. He's playing shortstop tonight. Pizzoni with an RBI double back in the second inning against Rhodes. Count 0-1 on Pizzoni as he takes a strike. Pitch from Rhodes, slapped the other way. Coming over is Bergeron, he can't get to the ball. That gets into the outfield for a single. Pizzoni two for two on the night now. Bergeron, good hustle getting over there, but couldn't make the play. I guess Bergeron this evening wishes he was just a couple of inches taller, or at least had a couple of inches longer on each arm because both times, uh, two times tonight, they managed to just poke a single past him just out of his reach. In fact, that one just tipped off the end of his glove, as you saw there on the replay. 
Well, it's Mike Hubel at the plate now. Runner on first base with one away, and he takes a strike. Hubel, we mentioned, had some problems defensively in that last inning. Surrey scoring two runs on two Hubel miscues. Hubel flied out in the, excuse me, flied out to first base in the second inning. His only at bat in tonight's contest. As Rhodes goes over to first to check on Pizzoni. Pizzoni doesn't have a stolen base this season. He's tried once unsuccessfully. Hubel, for his part, hitting 284 on the season with one home run and seven RBIs. Pitch from Rhodes is high and inside. Hubel is actually a product of uh, the Western League's feeder league system. Down in the Frontier League, he played for the Erie Sailors, who won the Frontier League championship last season. Erie, Pennsylvania for a long time, the home of the Pittsburgh Pirates single A team in the New York Penn League. Pitch from Rhodes is high. Count at two and one. You gotta wonder how a catcher feels coming up to the plate after taking such a beating after an inning. Well, I'm guessing he wants to do something to make everybody forget about it. I know that's what I'd be thinking. Rhodes still looking over at Pizzoni at first. 2-1 the count on Hubel. Rhodes set, goes to the plate. Wow, speed pitch, good for a strike. That, fu that fooled Hubel. I think it fooled a lot of our uh, viewing audience on that pitch. That pitch was well up around the letters. Bit generous for this level of baseball. Regardless, the count is even at two and two. Here's the road pitch. That one is hit hard into left field. Murphy on his horse going back. He won't be able to make the catch. Runner heading to third. Murphy's going to throw to second and try and get Hubel, but he's not in time. Hubel in there with a stand-up double as Pizzoni has moved over to third. One away, and DeFabia steps up to the plate with a chance to cash in a couple of runners for Tri-Cities. Well, Hubel was may certainly in, in the mood to make up for that last inning. He just drills this one hard to left field. And usually the ball carries really well to left in this ballpark. Maybe the air is a little bit heavy as of late with all the humidity, but this one finds the bottom of the fence, and now the, the posse have something going here in the fourth. Jerry DeFabia, the right fielder at the plate, hitting 323 for the season with one home run, 17 RBIs. He takes a ball. DeFabia grounded out to the pitcher Rhodes in the second inning with a runner on second, in fact. Here he's got runners in second and third. Pizzoni at third, Hubel at second. 1-0 pitch from Rhodes. That's a fastball that looked like it was low and outside, but called for a strike. I don't know, I, I, I wasn't watching my uh, monitor at the time. Well, it speeds up the game. You bet, count even at one and one. Fabi at the plate for Tri-Cities, facing Rhodes. Here's the pitch. We're getting a sneak preview of the new Palermo strike zone. I'm looking forward to those changes taking place in Major League Baseball after the All-Star break. Yeah, they're going to raise the mound, I understand. Raise the mound, bigger strike zones. Fewer times in between, uh, in between pitches, stepping out of the box, scratching and spitting. 1-2 pitch from Rhodes. Again, the ball sent out of play by DeFabia. Tri-City coming into the game, having just recently moved out of the basement of the Northern Division standings. Gray's Harbor now residing in that spot. Surrey, of course, is on top of the Northern Division with a three-game lead. Here, Rhodes. 1-2 pitch. That one gets away from Turles. Coming in from third is going to be Pazzoni, and he's going to score easily as Turles couldn't get to the ball. That's going to be a wild pitch against Rhodes. Moving down to third on the wild pitch is Mike Hubel. Here we see it on the replay. Pitch from Rhodes. Just gets away from Turles, who is in position, but uh, 
awful lot on that ball. It skipped over his shoulder, and it cost the Glaciers a run. So Tri-City now with a 3-2 lead here. Top of the fourth inning, runner on third and one away. The batter is Jerry DeFabio. Full now at three and two as Rhodes misses with the breaking ball. It's unfortunate on that wild pitch because uh, if those balls stay low, they go off the concrete backstop that you see back there. DeFabia chopping one just barely foul along the third baseline. But that backstop that you see, that green painted area, it's not actually padded, it's pure concrete. If a ball hits that, it comes right back at you at lightning speed. We've seen that on a couple of occasions, runners unable to advance on pass balls because the ball just gets back to the catcher so quickly. Here's the full count pitch from Rhodes. Hit in the air, foul behind home plate. It's great. It's gotten to the point where behind the third base grandstand, there are a bunch of kids just parked there, somewhat watching the game, but having their gloves at the ready to scramble towards any foul ball that comes that way. Gotta love this place. 3-2 from Rhodes. Swung on and missed. Fabio strikes out swinging. The second strike of the inning for Ricky Rhodes. Two away now in the top of the fourth. Sean Scott will step into the box, the leadoff hitter who's 0 for 2 so far tonight, having grounded out to shortstop to lead off the first inning. He also grounded out to the first baseman, Parker, back in the third. Mike Hubel aboard at third base, two away. Scott the batter. Pitch from Rhodes, swung on, hit towards second. Making the play is Bergeron, he'll flip to first, and that'll retire the side. So we're through three and a half here at the Stenson Bowl in Surrey. The score after three and a half innings, Surrey Glaciers two, the Tri-City, I want to call them the Americans, the Tri-City Posse, excuse me, with three runs as they pick up one on two hits. They leave one aboard here in the top of the fourth inning. City, uh, the area encompassed by Pasco, Kennewick, and Richland, Washington. Yeah, you were about to mention uh, the other team of Tri-City Spain. The Tri-City Americans who uh, have had some awfully good junior hockey teams of late. And just picked themselves up a pretty good general manager in Bob Brown, who uh, was involved in that bizarre firing up in Kamloops. Well, their loss is certainly that area's gain. And another guy people will remember that uh, was a general manager for the Tri-City Americans for a long time was Bob McCammon, the former Canucks head coach. So lots of links to that area. Speaking of links, we should mention that uh, Tom Treblehorn, the manager of the Tri-City Posse, uh, spent some time here in the Lower Mainland when uh, the Vancouver Canadians who played down at Nap Bailey were the Brewers affiliate. We're going to head down to Steve Erickson on the concourse right now. Thanks, guys. Yeah, I'm down here in the concourse. I left my position a bit, but Joe's upstairs. You got a bunch of bookwork sitting right here behind home plate. Everybody watches by. They think you're taking your scout or something like that, and you're really, really important to everybody. Tell us what you're doing. Basically, all I'm doing is uh, keeping a chart for the uh, manager and a pitching coach. Uh, it gives us an idea of uh, how the pitcher's doing when he's getting tired or whatnot by judging the speeds and uh, the location of the pitches and if they're up and if they're down. That's how you can tell when he's getting tired. And, and not only that, uh, just an idea of what the hitters are doing for me tomorrow as uh, being the starting pitcher. Uh, I tell you, you've got a big job because the, the way the pitches have changed so much, Joe, the pitches change so much, there's different pitches and there's all different styles. Oh, uh, yeah, well, you know, we got uh, four or five different pitches nowadays, and uh, guys are making up their own pitches, and, you know, and it's tough, too, working with the umpires. You know, it's really not that tough. You know, all you have to do is judge by the speeds, and, and it can pretty much tell you what pitches they are that they're throwing. Real, real quick final thoughts. We'll let you go back to work. You, are you pleased with the way the league's going? Yeah, I am. It's really going a lot better than I expected. You know, a new league like this, you don't you don't expect it to take off, you know, the way it is. And uh, Surrey, I think all we need to do is get a little more uh, publicity out there and uh, around Cloverdale and Langley and all of these places, and I think they'll start coming out. I fully agree with you. Thanks very much, Joe. We'll let you go back upstairs. we got to remind everybody right now, while Joe goes back up and sits and does some book work, because the radar gun just reminded me, the youngsters are out of school for the summer. Take some friendly advice. Slow down. Don't get caught. We want all the kids back next year, and we want them out here for the fill these stands. Back upstairs. Thanks a lot, Steve. Well, Joe Strong will be pitching in an all-star game in a couple days. 
here the batter is Ricky Scruggs and he slaps one to short but it's fielded cleanly by Cazzoni and he goes to first for the first out here in the bottom half of the fourth inning. They mentioned Joe Strong out with the radar gun tonight. Maybe he does uh, a bit of moonlighting on highway patrol around the area. Here's the Scruggs at bat as he swings through the Moore offering. Sends it up the middle but Cazzoni making a running grab. Fires about three-quarter arm over to first base and makes the out. So into the box is catcher John Turles. Turles flying one deep into left field. Over there is Kevin Booker, and Booker gets underneath it. That ball really carried, though, as Turles got that high in the air, and it carried deep into the corner in left field, but Booker got underneath it to record the out. So very quickly, Nestor Serrano comes up with two out here, the third baseman for the Surrey Glaciers, hitting 318 so far on the season. Serrano with a hit. In fact, the first Surrey hit back in the third inning when he led off. One for one tonight. And Joe Strong, uh, a guy that's really taken advantage here in the Western Baseball League. He's had a great season. Serrano swinging through the pitch. The count 0-2 now. Looks like Moore has picked up a little bit of second life here. Yeah, but uh, starting to fool those young hitters on the breaking outside pitch. Pulls the string beautifully there. Serrano sits down as he swings through the breaking ball. My goodness. What a quick inning as the Surrey Glaciers go down in order here in the bottom of the fourth. The score remains Tri-City Posse three, Surrey Glaciers two. We're through four complete. So with the score, 3-2. Tri-City on top, we'll take a short break and be back in a moment. the new Western Baseball League and the only Canadian city in the league is Surrey and our team is called the Surrey Glaciers. But if you want to see televised coverage of one of their games, then there's only one place to catch the action. And that's right here on Rogers Community 4. Our next game will be Saturday, July the 8th, when the Glaciers host the Grey Harbor Gulls. There will be a two-hour tape delay and can be seen at 9 p.m. So catch all the action right here on Rogers Community 4. Dixon in the spot, great save there by the goaltender, Bernard, the rebound! Watch this. The big man. <laughs> Sean Olsen calling the signal, pitches out to Ryan Cody, gets around the outside, gets the first down, and he's tackled. Before he takes it away, here's Cody, and he gets it to go! And he'll go to play the Barber Cody! Watching Rogers Community 4, serving Surrey, Langley, and New Westminster. We're back at the Stetson Bowl, everybody, where Ed Generelli has just flied out to Fidel Banuelos, who made a nice running grab out there in right field. The leadoff hitter, Generelli, getting a hold of a pitch from starter Ricky Rhodes, driving it into right field, and making the catch was Banuelos. There you see it. 
Now look at Ben Walos. He's got wheels and he can do everything in this league. He's been hitting the ball well and he's made a number of spectacular catches. We saw one in our last broadcast. Greg Musarino up at the plate right now and he takes ball one from starter Ricky Rhodes. The score 3 2. Surrey down by a run right now to this Tri City team. Rhodes is pitch fouled out of play. Musarino one for two in the, on the night. He got a single back in the third inning. Flied out to the shortstop Joe Lewis in the first inning. One ball, one strike. Don't have to tell you what Musarino's nickname is, I don't think. <laughs> Here he shows bunt but lays off the pitch and it's a ball. Can we change his name to Haas? Or? I guess Rhodes wants it to be moose hunting season. I hate being subtle. <laughs> <laughs> 2 1 pitch from Ricky Rhodes to Musarino. Off the plate, 3 1 now the count. Lovely evening out here at the Stetson Bowl in Surrey. Pleasant temperatures. The uh, heat wave appears to have ended here in the Fraser Valley. Yeah, much more pleasant than the stifling Hello. hot days of the last week. And Ricky Rhodes hits for a strike, moving the count to three and two against Musarino. Tri City on top, three two here. We're in the top of the fifth inning with one away. Musarino aboard with a walk. As Rhodes continues to walk people. In fact, uh, with the exception of the fourth inning, he's walked someone in every inning so far in this game. Alan Thompson will come to the plate now, taking a look at the pitch. You can see high and outside, not even near being a strike. But I guess we've come to expect that from Rhodes for uh, the entire first half of the season. But as you alluded before, I mean, at a five and one record, he's still getting the job done. And despite giving up three runs here, through four and a half innings. He's uh, within striking distance to pick up his sixth win. Surrey just down by one run. Thompson at the plate. Here's the pitch from Rhodes. That's a strike. You start to see a little bit of that glare coming in from the west. That's almost directly behind the first base bag. There you can see it there. As that sun gets lower, it gets difficult for catchers and charging third basemen to make that throw down to first. Ball is fouled deep into the stands. 0-2 now the count on Allen Thompson. Thompson without an official at bat, although he's picked up an RBI and has scored a run in this contest. Scored a run in the second after walking. That he walked to lead off the second inning. And he drove in a run with a sacrifice fly to center field in the third that scored Gianarelli. Right now it's Musarino at first. Here's the pitch. Thompson driving it deep to center field. Ernst going back, gets turned around, but he camps underneath the ball, and he'll make the catch. So maybe not the way you want your outfielder to field that one, but Ernst able to get there in time. He'll record the out, the second out of the fifth inning. Thompson showing a lot of power in two at-bats, unfortunately hitting it to the deepest part of the ballpark both times. A center field seems to be the dead zone of this ballpark. I mean, the ball hops out really well to left and right, but I've seen guys like Jim Murphy and Corey Parker hit the ball hard to center field, but once it gets up there, that sort of pseudo Nat Bailey heavy air theory sort of kicks in. Yeah, you saw the Thompson ball hang up there. Here Rhodes starts Booker off with a strike. Booker one for two on the night. He struck out in his last at bat, but had a single back in the second. Count even now at one and one. Booker hitting 267 with four home runs, 23 RBIs. He leads his team in RBIs. Right now he's got Musarino at first base. Musarino without much of a lead. Two away, ball shot up the middle. That's gonna be a base hit. Musarino takes the turn, but he's gonna be held to second. Nice shot up the middle for the former Hickory Crawdad. It's an affiliate of the Chicago White Sox organization. There you see a high fastball. Booker just fights it off and drives it up the middle for a single. 
So runners at first and second with two away. And Troy Babbitt steps up to the plate. Babbitt 0 for 2 tonight. Struck out swinging his last at bat. Here he takes a fastball outside for a ball. Babbitt getting the start at third base tonight. one -oh pitch from Rhodes. That one's high. Babbitt taking. Babbitt still looking for his first hit of the evening. He's 0 for 2. Struck out his last time. This time he sends it high and foul out of play. Throngs of kids waiting to get a hold of that foul ball. Reminds me of feeding pigeons in the park, Bill, <laughs> as they uh, <laughs> get a foul ball out there and the kids scamper. Haven't seen a big dust up over one yet, though. No, well mannered children here at the Stetson Bowl, no question. Two and one the count on Troy Babbitt. Two away. Top of five. Here's the pitch. Babbitt oh, fouling it out of play again. And there go the kids after it. I guess I guess I should mention about Troy Babbitt that uh, of course these players are only making somewhere in the vicinity of eight hundred to a thousand dollars a month for playing ball only over the four or five months that they get to play ball. During the off season, Troy Babbitt works for one of our sponsors, PepsiCo. Yeah. PepsiCo it is. Here's the 3-2. That one's going to get away. Excuse me, the 2-2 pitch. And that's going to get away from John Turlos. So the runners are able to advance. Wild pitches in consecutive innings now for Ricky Rhodes. Turles finds himself getting yet another workout back there. And now the count at 3-2. and two. You take a look at the pitch by Rhodes. There it is, straight fastball that just bounces in front of Turles and skips away from him, allowing the runners to advance. 3-2 pitch, Babbitt swinging, he'll chop it foul, stays alive. We mentioned that Rhodes does the job a lot, but one of the things that I guess sort of gives fans uh, reasons to take high blood pressure pills and stuff is that a lot of runners do get to scoring position on them. There's Babbitt driving one out into center field. Ernst on the run. He's going to get there and make the out though. Richard Ernst doing a good job in center field. Recording the out. Babbitt is retired and that'll end the top of the fifth. So two runners left aboard by the Tri-City Posse. And we go to the bottom of the fifth inning with Surrey down by a run. Your score is 3-2. Here's the replay. Pitch from Rhodes. Swung on by Babbitt and hit hard into center field. But Richard Ernst uh, getting on his wheels and tracking it down. My goodness, I needed my uh, high blood pressure pills there for a second. So coming up for Surrey here in the fifth inning, it's going to be Greg Berger on the second baseman, followed by shortstop Joe Lewis. Richard Ernst will be the third hitter, the leadoff hitter, here in the bottom of the fifth inning. Again, Surrey down, the score 3-2 right now. Tri-City on top by one. Still in the game are both starters for each team. Bobby Moore is still in there. As you see, manager Dick Phillips uh, pondering down the sidelines. Is a, you see the gorgeous sight down the left field line here at the Stetson Bowl. They've slapped a few more layers of paint on the place since the last homestand uh, before that dugout facing was painted blue and uh, there were still a lot of gray spots as you see some upcoming home games for the Surrey Glaciers. Sunday, Monday and Tuesday if they'll finish off this four game set against the Posse. Uh, the Monday game is actually an afternoon affair starting at 1 o'clock. It's not a 7.05 start but a 1 o'clock start and you can hear that game live on CITR 101.9 FM. Then Thursday, July 6th, the Grays Harbor Gulls make their first appearance, and that'll give you your first tour of all of the teams in the Western Baseball League. They'll start a four-game set that goes through next Sunday. There's hey, us, Bill. There we are. How's it going, folks? High atop the press box here at the Stetson Bowl. Foul ball fodder up here with no netting in front of us. Haven't had a play to make yet, but 
our cameraman has a once or twice. First pitch to Bergeron. He's swinging, lost it into right field, coming over is DeFabio, and he'll make the catch. Bergeron, first pitch hitting here in the bottom half of the fifth inning. That'll bring Joe Lewis to the plate, the shortstop who hit into a double play in his only at bat in the game so far. And you gotta wonder if 37-year-old Bobby Moore out there on the mound might be getting tired. Fatigue at 37. Well, that's a, that's the time uh, that's the time to prove his uh, his position on the roster. I mean, you mentioned that he badgered Tom Treblehorn in order to get his first Western League start, which he won. Lasted five innings only, though, in that start. Lewis turning it, and Troy Babbitt can't come up with the baseball, so Lewis is going to be aboard on a single. I don't think that's going to be ruled an error. An that's awful an tough awful play. tough play. So Lewis picks up a hit, and now he's one hit away again from breaking that Mendoza line. He came into the game hitting 194. Here you see he turns on the fastball from Bobby Moore, chops it down the third baseline. Babbitt forced to backhand it. See Dick Phillips scooting away from that play. So Lewis aboard at first. Lewis has good speed, but maybe isn't the greatest base runner in the world. Just two for six in his stolen base attempts. Swinging is Richard Ernst, and he lines it into center field, but right at center fielder Sean Scott. So quickly there's two away. Lewis scampers back to first, and Fidel Banuelos will step up to the plate. I don't know what the Surrey Glaciers know that I don't know, but there's been an awful lot of first pitch swinging here in the I inning. was going to mention that maybe words going around the dugout that you get a hold of Bobby Moore's best stuff uh, first time around. So maybe not wait around beyond that first pitch. Lewis almost caught leaning as Moore goes to first. Man, that gives managers sleepless nights. Big leads off first. Banuelos taking a strike on the outside corner. And he wasn't swinging on the first pitch. Didn't get his best stuff first time around. No, a nice pitch from where good location as he hit the outside corner. Here's the 0-1. Banuelos looking to bunt to get aboard with two out here. Fouls it off, and very quickly the count is 0-2. Banuelos is one for two on the evening. His last time up, he's singled and scored an RBI on the play. And thinking about that first pitch swinging thing, I guess when you're facing a veteran who's uh, going to be a little craftier than a rookie pitcher, you don't want to get too deep in the count. Here, Banuelo swinging through the 0-2 offering and keeping himself alive. But as you get deeper into the count, the possibilities, you know, the, they become greater, they spread out, and the uh, pitcher, of course, has more options. So I guess the Surrey players trying to avoid that. Yeah, you take a look at a lot of young pitchers and they take to the mound, they have maybe, in most cases, a professional pitcher in the early stage of his career will only have two or three pitches in his repertoire, as you see Moore deliver uh, a high breaking ball. As you can see, uh, one of the many options that Moore has to go to. 0-2 pitch to Banuelos is a pitch out. Lewis is going, but a bad throw from Hubel gets into the outfield. And there's a stolen base for Lewis, his third of the season. So Hubel con continues to have his troubles back there behind the plate. It was Lewis manages uh, only his third stolen base of the season, as you see that the throw by Hubel was nowhere near the bag. And I stand corrected. I thought that was a pitch out, but it was actually a breaking ball way outside <laughs> that Hubel had to deal with. <laughs> Sometimes it's hard to know the difference. But getting back to that thought on uh, pitchers and their repertoires, yeah, a veteran like Moore may have five or six pitches, which gives a lot for a hitter to think about deep in the count. It's an interesting debate among pitching coaches and the like. Uh, there are pitching coaches who say your, your three best pitches and just forget about the rest. There's other pitching coaches that encourage you to do anything possible to screw up a hitter's timing. Here Moore is unable to screw up Banuelos' timing as he throws him four consecutive balls after getting at Glaciers. 
Maybe tonight hitting 238, but he's showing a lot of power this season. Seven home runs and 23 RBIs. Here he drives one out into left field. Coming over is Booker. The ball is foul, however, and Booker can't come up with it. Yeah, that's one of the interesting characteristics of this ballpark. As you go farther down the line, foul territory narrows up to the point all the way down to the corner. Maybe we could get a shot of that down at the corner where you may see that there's like only half a foot of foul territory. There you see it there. You, where the fence ends, foul territory begins. So there's not a lot of room for a fielder to work with down there. Here more hits with a breaking ball on an 0-1 pitch, so the count now 0-2. Now thanks to the fine camera work of Jim Reese and his crew. 0-2, the pitch to Parker, it's outside. One and two now, runners at first and second. Banuelos got aboard with a walk before him. Joe Lewis got on board with a single and stole second. So runners at first and second, one, two, the count, two away here. Pitch to Parker again outside. Parker pretty much a pull hitter, but uh, we're seeing out in center field, Sean Scott playing to hit the opposite way. So there's a lot of green out there for Booker right in his power alley. Excuse me, that one's chopped down to first base. Coming over to make the out, however, is Alan Thompson as the ball took a big friendly hop for Thompson and he put it in his pocket, stepped on the bag and the inning is over. Surrey Glaciers leave two aboard. This contest is still Tri-City two, Sur excuse me, Tri-City three, Surrey two. After five complete, we'll go to the top of the sixth inning with Surrey down by one run. As, as you see, Nestor Serrano heading out to his position. Grounds crew taking to the field here in between the fifth and the sixth innings. Spruce things up a little bit. But this Glacier Ball Club has certainly shown the ability to come from behind in critical situations. Uh, we saw it earlier in the first home stand, as you see a happy Canada Day fan there. They've came back from behind a couple of times against the Long Beach Barracuda, and they've shown that they're capable of putting runs up in awful big numbers. A couple of times in the Bend series, they've sent uh, as many as 10 men up to the plate. That has been a characteristic of the great Glaciers this year, scoring runs in bunches, and we haven't had a big inning for Surrey so far in this contest, so that's something to look forward to. The three runs scored by the Tri-City Posse came in the second, third, and fourth innings. One run each in all of those innings. For Surrey, there were two runs scored back in the third. As you see one of the umpires in the Western Baseball League. I mentioned before, the umpires are, for the most part, fresh out of umpire school. But uh, this guy doesn't look fresh out of umpire school. He looks like he's been around for a while. Looking at the top 10 batting leaders in the Western Baseball League this season, Jim Murphy of Surrey in there at number four with that 354 average. Mike Smedes of Bend was hitting 420 just about a week and a half ago, so he's really gone into a slump of late. And now leading is another Bend player, Scott Tedder. Tedder performed well in the, in, in the uh, Glacier Series as they made their sweep through uh, the Stetson Bowl this week, but Mike, Mike Smedes, the, the big right fielder for the Bend Bandits, who we expected a lot of offensive production, was pretty much non-existent through the whole thing. But it should point out as well that Jim Murphy has come down a little bit in his average as well. He was hitting 368 coming into this week. At one time that early this season, he was flirting with the magic 400 number. Ron Pizzoni to lead things off, the shortstop for the Tri-City Posse. Pizzoni two for two tonight. He's got a double and a single. He's scored a run and has driven in a run, driving in the run with that double in the second inning. He scored in the fourth when he came around on Mike Hubble's double. First pitch to Pizzoni is off the plate for a ball. Ricky Rhodes still working for the Surrey Glaciers into his sixth inning of work now. All three runs against Ricky Rhodes have been earned runs as Surrey has not committed an error yet in this game. Count at one and one. Pitch to Pizzoni. 
checks his swing as the ball dies in the dirt in front of him, and the count moves to two and one. Should mention that Ron Pizzoni, like many other players in this league, had an offering during the Major League uh, Players Association strike. Spent some time with uh, the Seattle Mariners in replacement camp. Didn't get to play on opening day. Swinging at the 2-1 pitch, Pizzoni hits it to Lewis, and Lewis fires to first. A tougher play than it looked like there, as that ball took a real dip. After bouncing off the turf, you'll see it hit the lip of the turf here and just kind of come down, which is sort of an infielder's nightmare. There you see the dead hop. Oh, yeah. But Lewis, like the pro he is, plays it easily. Lewis has certainly provided some sparkling moments in the field for the Glaciers. Here's Mike Hubel at the plate, one for two with an RBI in this game. Hubel fouling off the first pitch. 284 on the season, one home run, seven RBIs. He's committed a costly error tonight, however. Here he takes a ball and the count is even at one and one. One one pitch, road fastball, gets the call from the umpire, and the count is now one and two. Hubel has played the majority of the Posse's games. He's making his 33rd appearance behind the plate this evening. One two pitch, and Hubel is pulled. He swings at it. He'll take a seat as he misses that one completely. If we get a look at the replay, you'll see him step out before he made his cut. Yeah, we'll get a chance to see that. See Hubel's front foot steps out of the box first and then the bat follows it. No way you're gonna hit an outside pitch doing that. Jimmy DeFabia, the batter now, and he's gonna line it up to third base. Over there to make the easy out is Parker. So Rhodes out of the inning with ease here. Top of the sixth is over. One, two, three for Ricky Rhodes. Score remains Surrey two, Tri-City three. Surrey coming up to bat. Nelson Murphy Scruggs, and as Dick Phillips shows a little bit of that hustle he showed with the Washington Senators back in the 60s. Yeah, and the managerial battle as, as players, Dick Phillips outshone uh, Tom Treblehorn <laughs> by a mile. I think Tom Treblehorn has a lot of sympathy for these guys that are struggling to get back into organized, quote unquote, baseball. Treblehorn never made it past double-A. We're going to go see Steve Erickson for a minute. Thanks, Bill. I'm downstairs right now. Rick, uh, Kathy left us. She's over there enjoying her popcorn. She's covered. <laughs> okay, now, tell us, uh, we were talking about the different classifications. You must be enjoying the ball out here. Excellent ball. Excellent ball. Yeah, I was quite surprised that they're uh, as skilled as they are, and I didn't realize they were as old as they were. Your understanding on the uh, whole complex, a little bit of a change from the Stetson Bowl. Much, much different. Beautiful place to watch a ball game. Beautiful place. Uh, it, it's quite nice. Now, Kathy was involved as a registrar for three years. Uh, both my boys played hockey, uh, Midget A and Bantam. It's nicer than an arena. Well, I'm, I'm really pleased you come out and, and spent your time out here with us rather than fight all the traffic on the road. Oh, yeah, good peanuts, good beer, good pot, <laughs> hot dogs. Thanks, Rick. We'll let you go back. And Kathy can move back over now because she was, she was real, really shy for us. Let's go back up to the broadcast booth. Thanks, Steve. Well, Jim Murphy leading it off for the Surrey Glaciers here in the bottom of the sixth inning. Looks at a ball outside. Still in the game, Bobby Moore, the starter. He's given up two runs. Only one of those earned, however. He's had a good outing, although he's been hit hard at times. Here's a breaking oh, ball. Murphy watches it for a strike. Murphy 0 for 2 tonight. He's the cleanup hitter in the Surrey lineup playing left field this evening. 1-1 one, one pitch. Murphy gets around on it, drives it past the third baseman, Babbitt. Murphy will take the turn. A big turn, but uh, he'll get back to first base. Nothing doing on the double, but he's in there with a single, a solidly hit ball. It just got past Troy Babbitt at third base. If you take a look at this, Troy Babbitt is the only thing on the Tri-City roster stopping this from becoming a double. Look at that hard hit right down the line. It's a, it's, it's a wonder that Babbitt was even able to get a glove on it. Well, Ricky Scruggs will step in now, batting from the left side. Scruggs 0 for 2. Grounded out to first base and one at bat and a very close play at first. 
as Moore goes over there. It looks like Murphy was leaning a little bit. Murphy has good speed. Seven for 10 in his stolen base attempts this season. Had to dangerously reach back there at the last second to avoid the tag. He's got a big lead down at first. Here's the pitch to Scruggs, and that ball is fouled back up into the stands, beyond the stands. 3-2 your score, Surrey down by a run to the Tri-City Posse. You're watching Surrey Glacier Baseball on Rogers Community 4. Here's the 0-1 pitch to Scruggs, that one's off the plate, count even now at 1-1. One one. Well, Ricky Scruggs with a big grand slam in our last broadcast. Man, that was a magic moment. Bases loaded, tie ball game in the eighth against uh, the, the Sonoma County Crushers. 1-1 one, one from Rhodes. He did a little crushing of his own. So the count at one and two. We're having a good outing on the mound right now. Pitching to Scruggs, Scruggs swinging, drives it into center field. Murphy's gonna have to get back to first as getting underneath it is gonna be Sean Scott. He'll retire Ricky Scruggs, fly out to center field. Murphy back at first, and John Turles, the catcher, will step up. Murphy was actually off on the pitch. Hit and run was probably on on that play. But you can't really hit and run if you pop up to center. So one of the all-star catchers in the all-star game in the Western Baseball League coming up next week is at the plate for the Surrey Glaciers, John Turles. First pitch from Rhodes, fouled straight back into the stands. Man, that is a position well earned. John Turles has not only done it with the stick, but he has retired a lot of runners. He has shown that he is easily one of the premier catchers in this league. And he's been recognized as such. Yeah. Rhodes going over to first. Murphy diving back ahead of the throw. Bobby Moore looking for his second win of the season. Came into the game with a 3.60 ERA. Here he fires low to the batter, Turles. Count even now at one and one with one away. Bottom of the sixth inning, Surrey down by a run. Murphy aboard at first, Turles at the plate. Here's a pitch out, Murphy going, the throw from Hubel. Yay! Murphy is retired. Perfectly executed by the Hubel. More things change, the more they and Tom Treblehorn saw something there. Well, Murphy was taking the big yeah. lead down at yeah, first, and Moore was keeping a close that. eye on it. Ten times, and you'll still never see it right. Throwing the pitch out oh, down there. Damn, yeah, you hear some away. cat calls the down, from no the, down from the stands, but you see there on the replay that Murphy didn't have a hope. Yeah, no question about it. Murphy thrown out on the pitch down out. Four, by the way. <laughs> Count now at three four. and one to Turles. I'll probably play it over two or three times for you. Well, the way, that pitch off the plate, and there's again. Actually, I should mention, some of those cat calls you're hearing are actually from our ambience microphones over the Surrey dugout. <laughs> <laughs> so so you, maybe you hear a, a few of the better one-liners from there than, than from the crowd. Turley is aboard with the walk, brings Nestor Serrano to the plate. Serrano struck out his last at bat in the fourth inning, struck out swinging. Picked up a single, though, in the third inning. 3-2, Surrey down by a run here, bottom of the sixth inning. Bobby Moore, the starter for the Tri-City Posse, still on the mound. Serrano in the box, the third baseman for Surrey. Serrano takes a ball. Three eighteen batting average for Serrano so far this season as he swings through the pitch from Moore. Serrano's been hitting the ball hard all week long. 
picked himself up a couple of 329-foot singles off the wall this week. Here he chops it to third. Babbitt goes to second for the out, and we're through six innings. So after six complete, we're going to take a break. The score, the Tri-City Posse three, the Surrey Glaciers two.